Hello, folks. This is Chris, the host of Comic Tropes. And today I've got a very special interview lined up for you. My guest today is Zach Davison, who has translated all sorts of manga. His current book is through Marvel, Demon Days with Peach Momoko. He's worked for a number of high profile creators, uh, collaborated with all sorts of different publishers. He's also worked uh, as an expert on yokai and yurai and oni we're going to talk about all this different stuff zach thank you so much for being here today yeah thanks for having me i'm excited we've been talking about this for a long time so i'm I, glad to I finally have it done and here we are uh, and, and just so that people behind the scenes know we live fairly close to each other like we, we could just been... basically just reach out and touch right now if we really wanted to as so we just like ready here Probably we go. on this side but yeah uh oh <laughs> You're on this um, side for me, so. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, originally I was like really hoping to do an in-person interview, mm -hmm. but you know, with COVID and everything, this hey. just felt easier for now. But I, yep, I, yep. I hope someday we do get to meet. Um, we definitely had some entertaining social media interactions. I want to start talking about your current book, Demon Days. Fantastic. You're doing yes. collaborating with Peach Momoko. Um, I've been enjoying this kind of a reimagining of not just X-Men, some other Marvel stuff in there. Obviously, Peach Momoko, tremendously popular. So this is like an exciting book to be on. One thing I'd love to start with is your credit here. It <laughs> says uh, Zach Davison, English adaptation. It does not say translation. It says adaptation. No, so and you'll one... notice the credit changes with every book, too. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't grab like the most recent yeah, one. Yeah, so yeah. I was wondering, though, if you yeah. could explain what your role so, on this book is. Yeah, and I mean, I, Demon Days for us, I just want to say it's an absolute joy to work on. I've been friends with Peach Moko for years. Um, we met together at Rose City Comic Con, I think in 2015. And it's just, it's one of the things that I love so much is your journey into comics is that one of the things people don't necessarily see is the steps that it took to get there, right? So I first met Peach. She was just like sitting at her little table in Artist Alley. She had her little self-published comic there, just like the rest of us, you know, and absolutely no one coming up and talk to her, like just no one, you know? Um, and so like, I talked to Peach and we hit it off and I bought her comic, you know, and gave her my comic and we swapped cards and everything. And this, this interaction happens every convention, like every convention, you come home with a pile of, all, all like just there's just so many people like me and like Pete at the time, you know, just sort of like trying to make our mark or find our way into where comics is for us. And, and Pete and I have kept in touch ever since then because I just really, you know, we liked each other and enjoyed her work a lot. And, um, you know, we've been actually trying to sort of like make a comic together. We've had some really good pitches in to different companies and it's never it's just never worked out, you know, for whatever reason, it just has never worked out. The magic never happened. The click never happened. Whoever the editor was never saw that. It was like, yeah, this is the one we're going to go for. Um, the last time I saw Peach was in 2019. She was here for Emerald City Comic Con. She's doing a signing down at um, this comic shop that's now no longer a business comics dungeon. So I go there to hang out with her. Great and shot. once again, not a single person showed up, not one. It was just me and Peach. Um, another friend of ours, Brian, just hanging out there the whole time with absolutely no one showing up. So it was pretty funny. Um, over the pandemic, once again, Pete and I were still doing a thing where we've actually had this like sort of like self-published comic that we were sort of putting together and we're trying to get a pitch deck ready and things like that. And Pete gets this deal with Marvel because her covers are starting to pick up, you know, and like, huge. and so, you know, um, but, she, but once again, she really wasn't that huge. I think that it was like really a Marvel's announcement of her with the Stormbreakers that really brought her out, you know, and that was just, you know, that was incredible. And so um, they contacted me because they're like, do you want to work on Demon Days with Peach? And I'm like, yes, of course I do. You know, so finally, Peach and I get to make the comic together. And we're super thrilled about it. Along with that, um, I got heard that the letter is Ariana Meyer, another good friend of mine, someone who lives here in Seattle. Um, I'm going to be going to her wedding not too long, like, like in basically a couple of weeks, you know, um, I actually introduced her to her fiance. And so it was just really just this, like our editor, Lindsay said, she really felt like there was just a lot of magic synergy together that she had unknowingly assembled this dream team of friends, you know, that was going to work on this comic. And that was true with Demon Days. So it's just, it's been an amazing experience to finally get to make a comic with Peach, you know, and to work and it, with this team. 
so, so, so it's what, a collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. What, That's what, what I was going to do. Is, yeah. What is your role in this, so, like, exactly? As to what I do on the comic, I know this is what causes the most confusion because a lot of people are familiar with me. Like, depending on where you know, you either know me as a translator, which I do, or a writer, which I do. Um, some people know that I'm both. Some people don't really understand that. I mean, I have written my own comics multiple times. Um, nothing really big, but I certainly have written them. You know, I've written my own books, and then I also translate a lot of stuff. So yeah. when I started working on Peach's work, so I don't think they really knew what they wanted to hire me for either. But I got Peach's script, you know, like her first script, and basically the process that we put together is almost like I would say old school Marvel method writing. So basically what Peach will do, Peach has a plot and then she'll send rough pencils. And then I'll take the rough pencils and then I dialogue the entire issue and do a fairly traditional comic book script. So like, I'll just take it and I'll do a, like Peach doesn't really, like she's drawing it herself. So she doesn't do like panel one, page one breakdowns, right? When she's, when she's doing it. So she just basically roughs out the issue and then sends it to me. And then from that, I will go ahead and break it into a traditional comic script. So I'll do like the panel one page thing, and then I'll dialogue the entire comic essentially. Um, and then like like every, sometimes in Peach's uh, like rough, she'll have like some bits of dialogue she wants in there, sometimes not. Um, but most of the dialogue is just me just generating it and then peach and i will go back and forth on the script basically collaborating together until we come up with something that we both think is really solid and then that's what goes in the comic well it, that's not true necessarily it goes past our editor Lindsay. will also look at it make edits and things like that but yeah that's what like there is no translation going on in demon days it's absolutely right. not a translation um they didn't really like there's a lot of i don't know things with the credit that goes on you know like English adaptation was what they had first come up with, but I was like, well, it's not really reflective we're doing. Um, so I was like, well, what about just like dialogue? I mean, script, like Marvel on their website officially has me as the co-writer. I think everywhere you look, there's a different, yeah. um, but I, I don't know. I don't really well, care I, too much about that. I it guess sounds the credit, like you, you know. It sounds like you really do use yeah. the traditional Marvel method just uh, updated for today. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. I would say the only difference between the traditional Marvel method is that from what I understand of the old school Marvel method is that whatever the writer said goes, and there's definitely a different layer in there because Peach and I will then basically collaborate on the final script. So like I'll write my script and then I'll send it to Peach and some stuff she doesn't like and some stuff she'll, you know, will discuss it back and forth like I think this needs to be in there and she'll be like I don't think it does and I'll be like well here's why and things like that and I also bring like like I bring a lot of Marvel stuff to it like that Peach doesn't necessarily have and so like like I was gonna say like Mm -hmm. because in the uh the most recent issue uh Mm -hmm. I was reading it and um some of the dialogue that was in there was very reminiscent of Claremont X-Men stuff, especially with like how Storm was talking to like, you know, how she would talk to oh, Colossus yeah. back in the day. Mm-hmm. Like you yep. sort of, I, I I could, I go, oh, I bet Zach is like, you know, a fan of Claremont's X-Men from like the eighties and stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. And all of that is, is for me. I mean, like I bring in a lot of stuff because, because that was my era of X-Men, you know? So if, Same. if I dialogue X-Men, they're going to sound like Claremont era X-Men, you know? Um, yeah. And I'll bring stuff in like that, that are to me like this little sort of like aside, like little stuff. I just put in there, little Easter eggs and things like that, that I, you know, I just, I hope someone reads them and finds them kind of fun. Um, but and like another really stuff, liked, like, um, there was a piece of dialogue uh, mm-hmm. in the most recent issue. I should have had that one beside me so that I could show, but um, where um, one of the characters was uh, singing a song, saying a poem essentially that mm-hmm. was in Japanese. And you must have collaborated fairly closely with the letterer be- to, to, to get it this way, like because it had both the, um, like the hiragana mm-hmm. and then like the English and like, you know, sort of a bigger bubble. And I thought that that was interesting because most of the time, if we read a comic book, it just has an asterisk and like uh, editors know this has been translated from Japanese. Yeah, that was something like Ariana, our letter, she did like a couple different takes on that because we had this idea that we wanted to to layer those. And Ariana and I had worked together earlier on Six Million Dollar Man. And we had also done um, this sort of like Japanese English layering technique because, you know, usually that's what you would do is you would do like, you know, like 
they would speak the Japanese and there'd be a little editor's note that's like, you know, translated from the Japanese, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, like that's how Claremont did it when he was doing his stuff. But Ariana and I were just like, we were trying to think of a way that we could, we could update that. I mean, you know, like what's a new way that we could bring that forward? And so we'd done yeah. some experimenting on $6 million man. And that meant that when we were working together on Demon Days, I was able to like pitch Ariana on this idea of like, well, I don't really pitch her. I just basically put a note in the script that was like, hey, Ariana, do something cool with this lettering. And she came back with a couple different variations on that. Um, yeah, so, and that was a lot of fun because I wanted to use this, this Basho poem uh, about a spider that I had, I really liked. And I thought, well, this would be a great way to introduce this into this. Um, and then I thought that it would just be kind of fun, um, you know, to have that sort of like Japanese in there so that people would understand that this was originally a Japanese poem and a trans, so that, in fact, that's the only bit of translation in all of Demon Days is that one Basho poem that I translated. That's so pretty cool. There is one single piece of translation in there. So that's like a, a fairly unique role. Of course, um, manga is, is a huge part of uh, American comics these days. I mean, you just go to any Barnes and Noble, let alone a um, comic book store, and, and you know the amount of manga out there is, is tremendous. Oh, by far. Um, I mean, Viz is currently, I believe, the number two comic book publisher in the United States. I believe Scholastic is number one and Viz Media is number two. I mean, that says it all. Like, uh, mm -hmm. of course, we we think of Marvel and DC, but no, you, you know, like what, what's on the shelves at um, big box stores like Target and Walmart oh, and stuff like yeah. that. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, it's just a huge part of comics. Uh, let, let's back up a little, though. Mm -hmm. When did you first start um, learning Japanese specifically? Like what 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 uh, prompted that as well so you know i mean it's it's a good question like i i think like i don't know if i i, I actually i do have a specific answer to this so let me just sort of get all my ducks in a row here like i've been a comic book fan and a japanese animation fan literally all my life like literally all my life when i grew up as a kid in the 70s um anime was everywhere it was huge you know people start a lot of people especially ideas or younger people, you know, but I mean, um, because it just makes me sound old, but a lot of people feel like the anime boom really happened in the 90s with Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball. That's actually quite untrue. We've gone through a few waves, you know. There was Guy King, mm -hmm. um, what, Battleship Yamamoto? Oh yeah, Space kids? Battleship Yamato, yeah, uh, Yamato. Galaxy Express that we watched. And so I just grew up on this stuff. Oh, like yeah. when I was a kid, the coolest toy in the world was going to guys Mazinger Z. Like if you had one of those and you went to school and you had a Mazinger Z, you were just the awesome stuff. And then Star Wars came out and Star Wars really kind of like blew all of that away um, and transitioned, you know, but then you had like, like I said, you had Battle of the Planets, you know, you had Space Battleship Yamato. And so I have always grown up with this understanding. And I think that's something that came later, the idea that these two things were separate. Because when I was grew up, like if you like comics, you also like Space Battleship Yamato. You also like the X-Men. You know, it was all just this sort of like fantasy world that you that you loved. And I loved it all too. Um, but it was never presented as Japanese. And I think that's a big difference. Like you were Space yeah. Battleship Yamato and Battle of the Planets were just presented as if they were an English language production. So my first real experience with the Japanese language was I think I was about nine and my mother took me to see the film Seven Samurai. And it was just amazing. I mean, I had never really, it was really my first immersive spirit experience with a foreign language in my life uh, where I was sitting in a theater, you know, reading subtitles for like three and a half hours. And it would just absolutely fascinated me. The idea that all of this gibbity gobbity that I couldn't understand was somehow comprehensible language just triggered some kind of click in me to where I really wanted to understand I and I really wanted to understand what it was like inside their heads like it like did you think in that gobbledygook like that kind of stuff was just fascinating to me um and so but unfortunately this was this was the 80s and I was in small town Washington in a place called Spokane and so there really wasn't it was really, I shouldn't say there wasn't much opportunity there was no opportunity you know I mean to do actually any sort of learning like this strangely enough in junior high uh, my school offered when you could first take a foreign language, Japanese was one of the options, and I took it, but I was one of two students who signed up for the Japanese class, so they canceled it due to lack of interest, um, something that would never happen nowadays because the world has changed so much. And just a lot of my life, I've always sort of like, I had dabbled in trying to learn Japanese, but as everyone who's tried to learn Japanese or learn Japanese will know and let you know, it is 
enormously difficult. It is complex. It is easily the most difficult language on earth for an English speaker. And that is not just hyperbole. Um, they actually have languages graded by difficulty for English speakers to master. There are two level five languages on earth which is level five is the highest difficulty. Those two languages are Arabic and Japanese. And Japanese of the two level five languages is starred, meaning that it's the more difficult of the two. So we took a small pause because uh, we thought that Zach was uh, about to get his Eisner delivered to him. I know, delivered mail. to me. I thought it was, I've been excited about this all day because I'm like, I'm like, I thought I would be like, oh, look, here's my Eisner award just on this show. How lucky. But it was just a piece of boring mail. So that's life. But FedEx tells me it is getting delivered today. What I was sort of like um, getting to was just that like you were talking about the difficulty of, of various foreign languages. And mm -hmm. I was uh, yeah. commenting on how with Japanese, not only when you're speaking, do you really have to understand where an object, a subject uh, and a verb goes? You know, it's a different order than we speak, um, sort of like Latin to a degree, but uh, they use several different written languages. And mm. I can memorize the hiragana and katakana, but the kanji, oh my God. Yeah, and even that, like that's more of the mechanical aspect of it, uh, which, me, is, which is difficult, of course. But the part that what really makes Japanese difficult is not the mechanics of it, it's not the grammar. It's the fact that Japanese is what's called a low context language, or no, the Japanese, sorry, is a high context language versus English, which is a low context language. So. Most Romance languages are low context. So what that means is that we have a conversation. We use all of the words that we need to make that conversation, right? Gotcha. I will walk up to you and be like, hi, how are you doing? My name is Zach. It's very nice to meet you. You know, like we just use a lot of words. Japanese is high context, which means that the vast majority of the conversation happens within context. You don't use words. You need to use cultural clues to fill in the blanks of the context that's going on. Like, for example, um, and I often use this example. So if I come from if I come into the house one day, my wife sitting on the couch my wife. might look at me and she will simply say one word. She'll say dish or sara. Now, from that. I will have known that before I went out this morning that I had breakfast, I will have known that I got a dish out and I was eating at the kitchen table. I will have known that I forgot to clean up after myself and put the dish away. Like there's all this context that's in there. She does not need to transmit all of that information that is already known, right? So in a high context language, you pick the word that transmits the context, right? That one word, dish, transmits everything that's required Now we would not do that in english we would use 50 60 100 a thousand words um, because we are a low context language so mm. that's the part that makes japanese complicated it's really not the mechanics the mechanics anyone can figure out the pronunciation anyone can figure out kanji it's not even really an issue in the modern world most japanese people don't know the kanji just like we don't know how to spell most words they look them up the same way we do okay. um, but the part that makes it complicated is absolutely the fact that it is a high context language so like when you're doing translation and everything if you only look at the words you will fail as a translator because the words are only there as essentially like sort of like place markers for the context and you have to figure out what's going on from that so Zach is saying, like, I, I think, correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, it's not something where you could put it into a Google translator. And even if Google, like, you know, translated each word correctly, you're, you're not actually necessarily getting the correct meaning. You have to, like, look for contextual clues, like who's talking to who, time of day, the this, this setting that the story mm -hmm. is taking place. Yeah, absolutely. Because the, the words themselves rarely deliver all of the information i mean rarely you have to really like get it you know there's just so much and when you're translating that into english you then need to fill in a lot of stuff right because if you're only translating the words themselves then it will be entirely unreadable from an english speaker's point of view that sounds like it would be um an extra big challenge because in comics you know uh space is at a premium the real estate mm -hmm. for um a word balloon a dialogue balloon is, uh, is only going to be so big, um, you really don't want to adjust too much of the art. Um, so I guess you have to sometimes think of 
shorthand ways to, to say oh, things? All the time. Yeah, all the time. I mean, and like, and Japanese can fit so much more meaning in a small, small real estate. Like when, um, when this guy, comic artist, I love music, Ishigeru, when his, when he was still alive, I used to translate his tweets for him on Twitter just for fun. And it would generally take, hey, there's this book. It would generally take me three tweets to translate one of his simply because Japanese can put so much more information in a small space. Right. Um, and for, yeah, for English, you know, when you're doing the translation, that's something you always have to keep in mind. It's like, how much real estate do I have here? Because that bubble, it's not going to change, right? It, so everything you write has to go into that, into that bubble. Um, and you, you just make decisions and doing translation, just like writing is all about making choices or any kind of art. It's all about making choices. And, and this is definitely of, stuff I want to know yeah. about, like, you know, how you do this, but I'd love to sort of like, uh, uh, still like go back just a little, like, when did you, when did you actually like in earnest start mm -hmm. studying? Like how uh, in earnest, I started studying like real. So basically I was living my whole life, you know, blah, blah, blah. I was 33 years old. I was a project manager at Amazon. This would have been late nineties. Um, and I was just sitting at my cubicle down in the international district. And I, uh, you know, I just had one of those weird moments. Like I, everything was going good for me. I was making good money. I had Amazon stock. I had good prospects and I was just sitting at my cubicle and I was like, is this it? Is this all I get out of my life? Is I 33, what am I going to do? Am I just going to keep being a corporate person? Am I going to sit here and tappy, tappy, tap at a computer, creating stuff that I don't care about, earning a paycheck and nothing else? Um, oh my God, I just got a doorbell again. If this is my Eisner Award, I am going to flip. So, let's see um, if it's your Eisner. Let's see if it's my actual Eisner Award this time. Simply a box from Amazon. Hey, speak of that. It's slightly contextual of my old job. So um, yeah, I was just, I was once again to get back into it, you know, I was 33 years old sitting in my corporate office and just had this moment like, is this it? Is this all I get out of my life? Do I, do I have nothing more interesting than making money in a corporate office? So I quit my job at Amazon. I well, actually not in this order because I did it. So I, I found this thing called the JET program and the JET program was like, oh, we will give you a one year visa to go and teach English in Japan. And I was like, why not? You know, so I submit my application. I got accepted, quit my Amazon job, uh, threw away my promising and bright future Good. and jumped on a plane to Japan where I'd never been before. Um, never really knew anything about the language. You know, I just went. And when I got there, I just, I just, and I, I was just fell in love with it. And I was where do you amazed. Uh, get set up. Yeah. I, what, 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 what town what or that? city? Oh, I went to I went to this place called Sakurai in Nara, which is something no one has ever heard of. I mean, it's the, really the equivalent of going to Spokane, Washington. I mean, it's just a yeah. little it's a little rinky dink town in the middle of nowhere. But um, still, Nara, the original yeah. capital, like people can like at least place roughly where you were. Mm -hmm. Famous what for the, years. One of the things that really shocked me when I got off the plane in Japan was how much. I knew how much I didn't know about Japan. Like everything I thought I knew about Japan, like all the stuff, like if you're like, oh, I love the anime, I love the manga, I eat the sushi. Like there's so many people who think they know Japan because they do all these very Japanese Japanese things here in America. And then you get to actual Japan, you're like, I know nothing. Like everything I think is Japanese, everything I think is cool doesn't exist there, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it's not that it doesn't exist there, but like, you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, I mean, and the, the stuff that's really popular in the West, that's Japanese, is the stuff that's really popular to Western tastes, you know, so it's not like this, right. the Japanese stuff that's popular in America is not the same stuff as the Japanese stuff that's popular in Japan, you know, um, and so it was just a really shock to me and, and I just loved it like I was just ravenous for knowledge I dove in I just like read everything I could. Um, I studied all the Japanese I could because when you're in J Japan. And especially when you're on the jet program, it's very easy to basically be a fish in a fishbowl and to carry your, the own, your water of your own country around with you mm -hmm. and only interact with English speakers and only really, you know, have this really catered experience. And I decided I didn't want that. And I knew that the only way to do that was going to be to master Japanese. There's no other way to get out of that bubble than with language, because language is the key to communication, which is the key to everything. So I just 
I ended up getting my master's degree when I was over there. I ended up staying in Japan for like around between seven and eight years. Um, got married, you know, all the all that kind of thing too. And just yeah, that's amazing. And uh, in that time, though, were you ever planning on using those skills to to get into comics, or you were just using it to <laughs> to sort of immerse yourself, right? Yeah, I mean, I really like, I've never been a person with a long term plan, to be honest. And so I wasn't thinking more than just the moment of how much, how much I loved it, how interesting it was. Um, one of the things I did discover in Japan that did kind of set me on my path to the future was the comic artist Shigeru Mizuki. And that was another one of those things that was just astounding, because he is yeah. so massive in Japan. And so and I had no idea who he was, right? Just yeah an incredible individual with an incredible mm -hmm. story and, and like for even taking it out of the context of being um japanese or anything an artist who lost his arm and learned how to draw with his uh non-dominant hand and then became oh yeah the mizuki that we know yeah but and on top of that i mean on top of his own story which is astounding is his role in japanese society right like he is literally someone in that in japan is he would be on like the Walt Disney level of famous and maybe even more. I mean, he's maybe even more to Japan than Walt Disney is to say American culture, right? The idea that you had never heard of Mizuki Shigeru was just not thinkable to a Japanese person. How could you not? He is simply one of the most famous human beings who has ever lived from the Japanese point of view because he is integral to their culture. I mean, their modern culture, especially. He is like, he is one of the great pillars upon which everything that we know about Japan stands. I mean, like almost every, and not even that, but even Western culture, like right. without Mizuki Shigeru, you would have no Pokemon. Without Mizuki Shigeru, you would have so much of the modern world would be different if he had never lived. And yet I had never heard of him. And that was just this massive shock to me because he is his, his fingerprints are all over Japan, like literally all over the country. Um, and so I just got fascinated. I learned about him. I read his books. I met him once very briefly at the World Yokai Conference in Kyoto, and it was just like amazing. And one night I got really drunk at my friend's bar and I climbed up on the table of my friend's bar and I raised my fist and I shouted, I shall be the one to bring Mizuki Shigeru to the West. And like, I literally did this. And so I it was like, I felt like I had this mission like as an apostle or an evangelist to just really share this truly amazing person um, who, was unknown outside of, you know, I mean, that's not true. I shouldn't say in the West. The, in the West is entirely wrong. Let's call it, call it what it is. In America, because in France, uh, Mizuki Shigeru is super famous. All of his works are translated. Everyone knows Mizuki Shigeru, right? It's really only America that of, of large comic markets that is, I would say, Mizuki blind, right? We were the only market. Well, correct me if I'm wrong here, Zach. It, it feels like the stuff... The the early stuff that seemed to filter from manga and anime over to America was very often like sort of robot based, you know, sci-fi type oh, yeah. ideas. Yeah. Whereas then, then that's, Shigeru that's really Mizuki point. was like working on a lot of stuff with like, you know, spirits and ethereal supernatural ideas that, that wasn't like a one for one translation with how we interpret maybe ghosts and stuff like that over here. Is, is yeah. any of that accurate? Well, I mean, kind of, but Mizuki, the uh, there's a little bit more to it. But um, one point you hit on is absolutely true, which is the sci-fi base, because early anime was essentially promoted by science fiction conventions because yeah. it was sold as other countries are also doing science fiction. So it wasn't its own thing. And that's why you got stuff like Space Battleship Yamato and Battle of the Planets, because it was like it was basically world sci-fi. And it's like, mm -hmm. hey, we love science fiction. Japan also does science fiction. And that's why science fiction started getting brought in. Then in the 90s, like Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon were these two big hits. And the West, like not the West, once again, America really imprinted on those two series. So it mm -hmm. became almost impossible to sell anything that wasn't like Sailor Moon or like Dragon Ball. Um, and you'll see so many series at the time that like they tried and failed, tried. And Mizuki stuff is nothing like Sailor Moon and nothing no. like Dragon Ball. Um, the other hard part about Mizuki, and I've heard this from multiple companies when I was got back from Japan and was trying to shop him around, is that he doesn't do one thing. He does a thousand things. And right. that is impossible to market, right? Because what shelf do you put him on, right? 
where do you put him? Like, it's so much easier to market someone when they do one thing. Right. Stephen King is a horror writer. Okay, got it, you know? Um, yeah, like, and, and yeah. if he wasn't Stephen King, like, you know, when he started writing some of his nonfiction stuff, like when he was just starting out, that would have been impossible. Yeah. And even though I'm showing like this particular mm. book that's well known by Shigeru Mizuki, this is nonfiction. But of course, like that's yeah, he he's got all sorts yeah. of genres that he's yeah. tackled. He does, he does. I mean, he does his comic book Kitaro, which is his sort of like children's ghost comic, you know, which I always don't say is like, you yeah. know, sort of like Hellboy meets the Adams family, you know. Even if I and and yeah. I need to keep interrupting, but like you just take a look at these pages mm -hmm. and you can see he can work in a very realistic style and he can have a very cartoony style, mm -hmm. which is more like what you were just talking about. And yep. but like He's very versatile in terms yeah. of what he can accomplish. Yeah. And it's because amazing. of that, he's too versatile, which made him really difficult to market, right? Because mm. like he does, he does these kids' comics, you know, right. then he does these intensely serious nonfiction comics. He does a biography of Adolf Hitler. He does, you know, like, and Mizuki has done so much that people don't even know it's Mizuki. Mizuki was the first person in the world to put a giant robot against a giant monster. Like, that is a Mizuki invention. He wrote the first comic book where you had a, basically Pacific Rim is Mizuki's invention, like all of it. Like, he created that genre. Um, Mizuki created the genre that the anime series Death Note is based on. Like, all of this stuff comes from Mizuki. And because of that, he is just impossible to market because he is um, this word actually only found out about when he died because it was great for his, his obituary. But um, there's a term called sui generis, which basically means a person who, def who is their genre, right? Mizuki yeah. Shigeru works in the genre of Mizuki Shigeru. And the only way to sell him is on that genre. Would we call somebody like Osamu Tezuka the same thing? Because I feel yeah. like he tackled oh, yeah. a number of genres and, yep. and also started doing like you know biographies and stuff mm -hmm. and the only reason people might be more familiar with him is because his initial stuff like astro boy again is that sort mm -hmm. of sci-fi that's easily understood like worldwide absolutely and alternately in in western comics he's you have someone like alan moore like alan moore is writing police procedural comics in top 10. Um, he's writing like basically fun adventure stories in Tom Strong. You know, oh, he um, he writes very serious stuff. He writes very light and funny stuff. Horror he, stuff and Swamp yeah, Thing, you know, like traditional Batman and Superman, some of the classic yep. stories. Yeah, he, that, that, that's a really interesting yeah. point. He did he did a dirty gag strip called DR and Quench. Um, I mean, Alan Moore is the same person. He's not limited by a single genre he writes everything yeah. and when we talk about alan moore we don't talk about alan moore the writer of superhero comics we don't talk about alan moore the writer of horror comics right because he is sui generis like sui like generis. mizuki shigeru right he is a person who defines and creates his own genre no one else could ever work in the genre of alan moore and once alan moore is dead that genre is gone forever and it's the exact same way that mizuki shigeru was Mizuki Shigeru created, defined, and lived, worked in his own genre. Um, and it really wasn't until John, Drawn and Quarterly got a hold of the license and sort of figured out that the way to sell Mizuki was not as a manga artist, but as a world cartoonist, right? One of the most important world cartoonists. Like that was the how they basically cracked the code of how to market Mizuki was to market him as Mizuki, not as part of something else. And I think that that's where we were really successful in working with him. It just sort of speaks to how important uh, marketing is. But that oh, must yeah. have been really interesting. You know, like, let me talk briefly. I, you, you worked on several different things, but let's talk briefly about the Showa series uh, where, uh, you know, Mizuki Shigeru created like several huge thick volumes detailing an entire era mm -hmm. uh, post-war, well, leading up to, I should say, like the World War II and, and dealing with World War II era. Um, Japan, when you started translating this, were you already familiar with any of this history or did this like just become a crash course in Japanese history for you? Oh yeah, no, I mean, I was, and it was, it, working on that was astounding. It was not only, it was my first professional comics work, you know, my first professional translation. Um, I kind of bluffed my way into it for lack of a better term. You know, I basically like, I that was also great because I literally went on to the, 
website for drawn and quarterly and hit their little contact us form and wrote this big email about how passionate I was about music and Shigeto. And fortunately drawn and quarterly is a small enough company that that actually went straight to the founder, Chris Oliver. So he's like, yeah, okay, we'll give you a shot. You know? Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Like I owe a lot to Chris. I mean, he really gave me my break, which everyone that works in comics at some point in time, someone is the person that offers you a chance. And when that chance comes, you really you have to, yeah, you got to be ready and you got to knock it out of the park. So um, when I was working on it, like I knew, I knew the history of World War II, but I knew what I call now the victor's narrative. Like that's what I had, I had grown up studying American history, World War II, right? right. And I had to realize when I was reading um, Showa that much of what I learned was not necessarily true or to quote Ben Kenobi, it was true from a certain it's point, of, point view, of view, right? Um, and so, it was, you know, you had to unlearn much of what you had learned. And I did a lot of deep diving. Like I read, um, I read uh, Blix's Pulitzer Prize winning book on Hirohito, um, the book in, um, what was it called? God, what is, oh, no, I forgot the word of it. Uh, blah, 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 something about defeat. I don't know. I can't even remember the term, but I basically got a big stack of books about World War, oh, Embracing Defeat. That was it. Embracing Defeat was a huge book that I read. I um, mean, just tried to garner as much knowledge as I could on World War II and on, on the specifically the Japanese side of World War II and not the, like, like when you click the timeline of World War II and this was something that I really didn't know until I might've heard it once, but it just didn't stick. Like, like when does the calendar start, you know? Uh, for America, December 7th, you know, 1949, the day that we'll live in infamy, pack on Pearl Harbor is day one, right? But from Japan's point of view, that was like, yeah, year five, right? They were already pretty solidly into it by the they time it got up a lot that. of the Pacific mm -hmm. uh, Oceana area at that point. Yeah, uh, they had really. And we, you know, and so I, I just learned so much. And I learned like, you know, I had grown up, you know, thinking about this idea that the Japanese people were these sort of like fanatical, you know, soldiers willing to die for the emperor and all of this, you know, which you then realize it was a lot of propaganda that was told to the American people to justify what we did to Japan, right? I mean, it was like, like a lot of that stuff is just not true. Like that I, image of Japan is this, you know, fanatical, like worshiping the emperor, you know, like, like kamikaze pilots. Being I was just going to say, we're, example, we're taught the word you know? kamikaze. That's yeah. like a, a, an early thing that we learned. You know? And then you learn that kamikazes didn't want to be kamikaze pilots, but they were sat, there was actually a, a commissar essentially who sat with a gun and every single comic, like, you know, you would get lined up and he'd be like, all right, guys, go in your planes. And they would be like, no, I don't want to. And he would just shoot you dead right in front of the, the rest of the people. Um, so basically every person, you were, you were going to die. There was no walking away. There was no like, like they didn't volunteer, you know, maybe some of them did, but it wasn't like this, like, oh, I really am this fanatic person. I want to go fight and die. It was literally like, I'll just shoot you dead right here, or you can get in that plane. Um, it's not and a that's very your religious option. society. It's not uh, like, I mean, you know, like religion motivates like a lot of people to 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 do certain things, but but not, not no, I mean, just society. It, and it was religious in the way that like, you know, and that that gets into some deep cultural notes here. But I mean, like one of the things that Japan learned from the West, and this was post Meiji period, was how to utilize um, religion as a means of social control. And so the um, the cult of the emperor and everything was basically instigated following the first contact with the West of the Meiji period, because they saw how all of these countries instituted um, religion as a method of control, you know, like the UK would do it. I mean, basically every country did it, right? The US also. And so, so they kind of learned that tactic from the US and used it to form this cult of emperor worship that really didn't exist prior to the Meiji period, right? It was a very specific thing that they had done and vanished as soon as they lost World War II, because it was simply a weapon in their toolbox, I guess, to try and force the people to follow their leader. Let me let me let me bring this up. Like you know, mm -hmm. we're uh, two smart guys. You obviously even more so than me. And, uh, this is an interesting stuff stuff to talk about. And at the same time, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know, we're two white guys in Washington talking about this. Like, where oh, yeah. do you think somebody should like really start if they wanted to, you know, in earnest? learn some of this uh, history from from like you know a different point of view well i mean that's what showa history of japan is for i mean that's one of the reasons why i felt that right. translating it 
Yeah, exactly. So I thought I felt I, I still feel like of all the comic book work I've done, that is the one that is my contribution to world literature to make that available because it is the history of Japan told by a Japanese person who lived through it. Like those right. three things, like people will say, is it like mouse? I'm like, well, kind of in that it's telling it using a comic book, but mouse was not written and drawn by someone that actually lived through it. You know, it's a it's a passed on story, whereas Mizuki is I mean, it's that amazingly rare situation where you know i mean will eisner might be another but i don't think will eisner ever actually saw combat you know uh, charles schultz actually saw combat but he certainly didn't draw about it um you know so no, you had a you, you yeah. might have somebody like kirby but like he would tell it in a not a literal fashion he mm -hmm. you just sort of have to read between the lines if you read a lot of jack kirby you could sort of get an impression of what he thought about war Mm -hmm. But you're right. Like, there's not exactly. too many people that talk about their specific experience mm -hmm. going through not just a war, but a you know cultural upheaval, and and a way as unvarnished as the way that Mizuki Shigeru does it. I mean, I think that like even reading his books, because Mizuki Shigeru himself was just such a humanist, and so his work is very human, hum, human, and presented almost without apology. Right? Like, there's scenes where he's in a foxhole and all of a sudden he has to take a crap. I mean, it's just like stuff like that is what makes it so amazing. And that's, that is, you know, that is where I would guide everyone. It's like, if you want to know more about that period, read Showa History of Japan. There is no better textbook. I mean, that translation that I did there, it's taught at West Point in their military history courses. Um, it's taught at multiple universities in multiple languages across the United States, or not across the, I mean, across the world, because obviously it's been translated into French, it's been translated into Spanish. I mean, it's been translated into innumerable languages, which I am only the English translator and nothing else. I mean, the work itself is really the important part. But the important thing we want you to take away from today is to get Demon Days. Yes. X -Men. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, I we can go off on so many tangents, and I don't want to oh, bore your comic book artists or your, your like, comic book audience. So yeah, I was being ridiculous because, yeah. like, you know, like it's all comics, and that's it, personally yeah. something I love about comics is that it can be so versatile. And it is all comics to me, and that's one of my great joys has always been in comics is that I I've always felt that like I've never you know like Mizuki himself who's example I've tried to follow I've never really tried to I've never allowed myself to be or tried my best not to allow myself to be pigeonholed into being one guy who does one things which is why I'm one of the few people that I know of that works in both Japanese comics you know that works in both western comics um, who writes non-fiction books who writes fiction prose books because I like that example that Mizuki did where he's just like why be one thing you know why and, why not and be I don't have an example things? like here to just sort of like use as a prop but um I, I admired uh, the um, pieces that you wrote in the back of uh, Wayward. In oh, yeah. The yeah. Comic, uh, Jim Zub did. Mm -hmm. It was set in Japan. Um, and you did some pieces in that. Do you want to like briefly talk about how you guys collaborated to, to come up with doing that? Yeah, that was um, that was one of those things like it's, it's always kind of funny when people hire me to work on their comic because I get really excited about it. I always do one more than you want to hire me for. So Jim Zub had like and I saw you pulled up Devil Man, so we can talk about that too. So I saw that, uh, yeah, Jim Zub, like I didn't know Jim Zub at all, but a lot of comics is done through networking. You know, there's like this thing where it's like, hey, I know a guy, you know a guy, you know? And so a friend of mine, uh, Brandon Seffert, had been friends with Jim Zub, and Jim Zub was like, hey, I'm thinking of doing this new Japan inspired comic, but I want someone to write an essay for the first issue. And so Brandon put me in touch with Jim, and I kind of Googled Jim on the internet and I found out he's, he writes this funny D and D comic called skull kickers. And so I like really was just like, I thought very little of him at the time. Like I have to admit, you know, and he knows this dude cause we both know this because he wrote me this story and he's or this email. He's like, Hey, I'm looking for someone to help. And I just wrote him back like this really curt, like maybe like three words, like, sure. I'll look at what you got, you know, Zach. And then he sends me the script for wayward and it was just brilliant. I loved it so much. Like I loved it. And then I wrote the first backup essay and I said like, hey, Jim, just so you know, this is not the one essay. I'm going to be doing one of these for every single comic you put out. Um, I just thought I should tell you that. And yeah. so I basically just hired, a thing. Yeah, I basically just hired myself on to Wayward for the duration um, to be 
the person that writes all these essays. And then I wrote Jib and I'm like, hey, you know, like, oh, I, by the way, I want to do these like backup yokai files, you know, for Wayward because that was something Mizuki Shigeru had always done. He'd always done yokai files in the back of Kitaro, you know, like a little one page thing about the yokai that was in that adventure. And I love them. So I did them in the drawn and quarterly translations of Kitaro. And I told Jim, I'm like, let's do these Wayward or these yokai files. He's like, awesome. And then when I'm doing Demon Days, it's yokai files again yeah. because that's you know that's and, and what so i do it gives such good context though yeah. to like what you read um yeah at the very back you've got yokai files yep. and yokai yeah. just in case somebody doesn't know kind of translates loosely to like you know spirits yeah monster i mean it's just you know monster. basically you know anything like that yeah. so yeah i and i just wrote the editor Lin, yeah i wrote Lindsay, and i'm like hey you know i could do this right. can i also do these backup yokai files and they were like, sure. And Peach was excited because that meant that she got to do illustrations of the traditional yokai forums. And yeah, I mean, if anyone hires me to do a comic and I trust me, you'll be like, hey, Zach, we'd like you to write one word. I'd be like, awesome. Here's 50, you know, and then I think next what worked, you're gonna get uh, in a way for Wayward was that, though, it was sort of like an expat story. And um, oh, so yeah. it kind of like really worked to have somebody like yourself, like, you know, give their perspective on, on some of the um, Japanese history and stuff. Like oh, yeah. It, yeah. It fit thematically to a degree, I thought. Which is good. I mean, I thought it worked out. You know, I thought Wayward was a great comic. I still think Wayward is a fantastic comic. Speaking Very proud of, like, of my work. Monsters here. and stuff. I'd love yeah, to. Yeah, nice you segue. Like this. Oh yeah. Because Nagai is another very famous uh, guy who uh, one that like some people in America have probably known going back to the seventies or so because of things like Mazinger. Um, but Devil Man is also one of his big properties. It has to do mm -hmm. with like demons essentially. Um, how did you get pulled into working for, uh, I guess it was seven seas. Yeah. So I had, I had translated queen Emeraldus, which was Leiji Matsumoto's work for Kodansha. And then seven seas got the license to do some other classic manga work. So, um, uh, from Leiji Matsumoto from, and from Gonagai, and they basically just wrote me out of the blue saying like, Hey, we're looking for a translator to to do these series. And I was just like, I was absolutely into it, obviously, because it's, you know, some of the great classics of Japanese comics. Um, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Is a classic. Devil, Devil Man was, I mean, and Devil Man was so much fun to work on because I mean, I, I grew up on Devil, on Gona Guy stuff, but mostly his robots. So I grew up on like Mazinga Z and, you know, like his sort of like um, giant robot stuff. But Devil Man was obviously also just fantastic and, and was so much fun for me because you get the, every time you, translate a new person the hardest part of any new person when you translate is trying to find their voice right so like i know music is his voice really well i could just slip right into his voice instantly um i know lady matsumoto's voice really well once again you just slip into it instantly but when you get someone else like you get going to guy it's all it's that's the hurdle to get over is to try and figure out how does he sound in English? So that's just the simple matter of processing it. And it never really is how someone sounds in English. Like my best explanation of a translation is like someone doing a cover song. Like I could sing you any song in the world, you know, I could sing you my version of it. And it is never going to be the original. Even if I'm a pretty good mimic, it's always going to be slightly different. And a lot of times it's going to be very different because what you're hearing is my version of that cover song. And a translation is essentially the same thing it is a cover song so it's it's me doing their voice and finding going to guy's voice you know as best i can and someone else will have a different voice that they hear when they hear going to the guy speak and so that's that's what i project onto the page one thing i bet was like interesting is like early on in the chapters there's like quite a bit of exposition to set oh, yeah. up like the story yeah and that must have been like part of like finding the right voice so that like, you know, you can tell these characters apart, but you can understand the whole the concepts that they're about to introduce here mm -hmm. with like, you know, demons invading the earth and possessing yep. people. I looked at this and I was like, you know, only reading this like fairly recently. It was interesting to see like how, you know, sort of simple and cartoony some of his like art is. And then you'll get to like, you know, the demon fights and stuff and it'll be tremendously gory. And it's like very reminiscent of like stuff you see, like, you know, Fist of North Star, Berserk. Oh yeah. Jack. yeah. Like, you know, it, it's just yeah. interesting to see like some, some of the earlier manga that like was um, sort of blending those two worlds of sort of like cartoony with like really hyper violent stuff. Yeah. And, and a lot of that, you know, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lineage that goes through like the, 
the cartoony paired with the hyper realism is really kind of Mizuki Shigeru's hallmark. Like he introduced that. Mizuki got a lot of that from EC Comics, where he studied from, because EC Comics also had a huge influence on Japanese comic books, because post World War II, um, you had the American occupation, right? So you had all these GIs stationed in the in Japan, and they would right. get care packages of American comics, you know, and what was popular at the time, which was EC horror EC comics. comics. And so Japan had this massive import of Western horror comics. And oh, wow. Mizuki's uh, father actually worked for the American embassy. And so he collected giant boxes of these Western EC comics to bring home to his son, who is trying to be a comic artist, who then passes them out to everyone. And so they're all studying EC horror comics on how to make comics, right? That's their Wow. their book you know um and all of that gets put into this into this comic series and then you have someone like gona guy who's basically what i would consider to be like almost like a third wave creator so gona guy is one of those like you had people like mizugi and people like tezuka and they had comics that they grew up as kids like the nora kun stuff and stuff like that but then they're really like the first ones to then elevate that i guess to a next level right so you had mainstream like to, to yeah mainstream appeal yeah mainstream mm -hmm. appeal and just really just bring into manga to be you know like this massive powerful cultural force and then you had people like leiji matsumoto and go nagai and they were sort of the next wave and they were the ones who grew up on mizugi's work and grew up on tezuka's work and decided to be car you know they were they would have been like i think in modern they would have been your first fan turns pro generation right of people right. like roy thomas growing up on stan lee's work exactly right and right. deciding like i want to make comics for a living because people like music he didn't want to make comics for a living he just wanted to make a living he was growing up in post-war <laughs> japan he was starving to death and he could draw and the best paycheck came from comics. So um... the, the, the parallels there are fascinating because, like, you know, when did the American industry become huge? It was during mm -hmm. the Great Depression. People were just yep. like looking for work. Oh, yeah. In, in, in Japan, post war. Post war. Again, like people like were hungry and like looking to exploit their talents for whatever they could. And that's when like manga becomes this yep. force to be reckoned with. It, it's really fascinating seeing like parallels across the world in what makes comics popular. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's also one of the reasons why I like I'll do these things, these lectures at convention and stuff, why I think the whole manga versus comic split is forced and fake and we should just be done with it. It's all comics, right? It's all comics. It's yeah, comics all the way down. It. Yeah. I, I don't have my t-shirt here, but I'll plug myself since this is my channel, folks. <laughs> I've got a shirt and it's like uses the font of like different things. It's got comics, manga, bande dessine, fumetti. Mm -hmm historiettas it's all comics it's all, it's all comics. comics yep yep exactly and followed fairly similar evolutionary paths you know as you can see but there's i mean there's definitely splits on the you know there's definitely places that manga went that uh western comics or american comics didn't i think the biggest split was the american focus on children right the like american comics really doubled down on we're creating a child's product product for children um, whereas japan really doubled down on it's a medium of storytelling. The audience better. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, and, and comics did up through a certain point, like up through the 50s or 60s, mm -hmm. American comics did that as well. You know, you had your EC comics, you still mm -hmm. had Superman, um, you had romance comics, you had all these yep. different genres. And uh, Japan just sort of never really yeah. lost that. It, yep. it, it, it's amazing. Yeah, and it is basically those same things. So it's like, imagine if that, push of 50s comics in the US with all those genres for all people, if that just kept going, you know, and expanded and basically Sometimes you wonder if like, you know, the comics code or something was what like, you know, potentially like um, retarded that growth for, for oh, yeah. comics. I mean, I would say creativity I... and great stuff. Yeah. I'm not saying you don't, but it but it is interesting to see like, you know, that one sort of sub genre in America took hold Mm -hmm. dominant just you know for 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 so long and I, i'm glad that we live you know today where we can start to see more genres start to like open up again in, in oh comics, yeah uh, absolutely and i think that you'll get a lot of that like now that we're seeing more japanese comics coming in um it's giving more oh, western man. artists to see this po this potential of stuff it's like nice. wow i can do a whole comic that's just about cooking or i can do a whole and then 
crowdfunding has also opened up so many opportunities because now you you don't have to make that successful a comic. You could make a comic that's successful enough, you know? Yes. You're like, hey, I want to make a comic about, I don't know, gay hockey players. All right, here you go. You know, here's... As long you know, as you can find the audience. Yeah, well, you know what, like, exactly. you, you, you used to go to conventions and table. You were talking about Rose City yeah. Comic Con and Emerald City Comic Con. And, you know, I've, I've done that same stuff. And, and if you go to especially small press conventions mm -hmm. or Artist Alley, you're going to see different stuff. What unites it all? Passion. Because mm -hmm. people have to, like, pay to get, like, that table space and stuff. Yep, yep. And yeah, you're going to get different levels of quality, but you're going to see a lot of passion. So I love exploring Artist Alley because you're going to see some very different comics there. Yep, absolutely. And I, you, you know, know I mean, a, I a friend of mine, like, that. what's that? I, I just thought of something. Maybe you can like help explain some of this mm -hmm. to me. You know, over here, we still, we have very different rules on um, copyright and stuff mm -hmm. compared to Japan. In Japan, you can go to comic book stores and get like essentially small press fan made stuff that uses like existing licenses. Of, of, oh yeah. Of, yeah. Like, like I found this weird comic last time I was in Japan. Mm -hmm. This is not official, but it's like, just like all sorts of stories about like the Ninja Turtles, like having different adventures. And like, honestly, like a lot of it is sort of like uh, slightly yaoi, like, like yeah. and stuff. I mean, and just so you know, that's all passion. Fine. The yeah, art is, is incredible. But it's also all highly illegal. I mean, that is also all illegal. Like the copyright is not different. It's that no one's enforcing them. I mean, that's, that's what really saying. the difference. No one enforces and, yeah. it. That's what's different. Like, because yeah. you can get this like just at a comic book store. Like that's where I got it. Like, yeah, it's called they're, called, they're called, they're called doujinshis. And they're basically, <laughs> um, you know, they're basically fanfic. I mean, that's what they are. Is they're that's fanfic, exactly what it is. but that people print and sell. And for the most part, like a lot of that is considered by comic companies to be sort of like tryout. Like that's where young artists learn their craft, you know. Um, and so they they as bat long an as it eye isn't to too it. big, they're not going to go after them. Exactly, exactly. As long as I mean, but if they get too big, they just hire them. You know, I mean, that's the thing. Um, that's fascinating. And it is fast. It's also really interesting because, like, I I once worked with um with a co with a company that was doing digital comics, and they had brought me in on as a consultant to try and see if they could get people to sell their self-made doujinshi on their digital comic platforms. Cause you have digital doujinshi nowadays as well, of course. And they were having such a difficult time with it. And I was like, well, one of the reasons why is because, um, well, there's both like, first of all, they were like, they only wanted stuff that was original IP. They didn't want any um, corporate IP stuff. Cause that would be a headache. And I'm like, well, okay, well that limits your market. That's fine. That's fair. Cause there are people out there doing original IP stuff. But then they were like, they said they had so much resistance to people wanting to make money off of it. And I'm like, a large part of that is Japanese income tax reporting because basically your employer has access to your income tax records. And so if your employer suddenly starts seeing that you're getting an extra income from this outside source that you've probably kept secret because you're just doing it for fun. Um, and so like the small amount of money that they would make off licensing their comics their, their wasn't worth job. losing their job and trying to explain to their boss why they were doing you know porn teenage mutant ninja turtles knockoffs and stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> i love so, that that would be that would be a good thing to explain know, to your boss like, right yeah that uh yeah that extra hundred bucks i make a month i draw a little bit of uh yeah, yeah, porno little... tmnt mm -hmm. You know, I just get a little extra, a little extra from you know selling on my line account. You know, what do you guys, what are you drawing? It's like ah, ah. weird stuff. <laughs> weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. So that's it's, I mean, and that's why it's hard to make a breakthrough through. A, I mean, there's multiple cultural barriers there why they're having a hard time making a breakthrough with those. But but I mean, doujinshi are just like they're considered to be, you know, part of the ecosystem of manga. And I think that's also one of the things about, because people talk about that a lot. They're like, you know, why is manga skyrocketing in sales and superheroes are not, you know? Um, and a large part is also the ecosystem, right? Because you have this world of Japan, of Japanese media and the technical game for this is called transmedia. And I've taught classes on this at the UW, so, or the University of Washington. So basically how it works is that you have all of this stuff that supports each other, right? So the, the comic supports the cartoon, 
supports the game, right. supports the toys, supports the comics, supports the cartoons, right? So it's all in this same sort of general ecosystem. So that if you're a fan of something, like say you pick up a new comic, like I've been reading Space Brothers recently and Space Brothers is phenomenal. It is such a good comic. It is just like one of the best comics I've read in years. And then I can go and watch the anime and it will support the comic, the two walk in step with each other. And then right. if I want to, I can move out and expand that, that interest, right? So it's all reinforcing each other. Now, if you're watching, as we all know, um, say you walk, picked up, and this is always my example, because it's so sad and also true. Say you went and saw the Captain Marvel movie and you loved it. It was so good. And you're like, I want to get that Captain Marvel comic. I want more of this character. And you go to a comic shop and there are five Captain Marvel Volume 1 trades. And there are four Captain Marvel Volume 2 trades. Where and there start? is no idea which one you start at, which one goes to next. The American entertainment properties like that, and comic properties, well, I should say Marvel DC properties specifically, they do not support each other. But then you get something like The Boys, that does support each other, and you see this huge sales leap off of the TV show, you know? Um, so Japan's ability to, they are masters of transmedia. They are absolute yeah. masters of it. Yeah, I don't think that like uh, we've ever been great at numbering comics over here. I think like, I love Hellboy, but that's another one that can be really tricky to figure out like where to uh, jump in, I think. Although um, I will, and I would say that Dark Horse has actually done an excellent job of rebinding Hellboy as these omnibi, right? So yeah, right new, now it's no longer is definitely yeah. the way to go. You just you start Hellboy omnibi one, you know Hellboy omnibi two, and they follow each other. But even yeah. more than that, like like Hellboy the movie is a totally different character than Hellboy the comic. Story right. is different, characters are different, love interests are different. They not only do they not support each other, they actively distance themselves from each other, right? They actively are separate things. Whereas you don't get that as much in the Japanese ecosystem of transmedia, where they they might tell like a slightly different story, they might tell a variation of it, but they are not actually unrecognizable to each other. You know, um, Mike yeah. Mignola so will you all. Compare, you know, how would you compare this? Like, if we hmm. jump back to the '80s, Marvel was for a while like you know, the, the, it was huge. GI Joe mm -hmm. was huge. Mm -hmm. The toy. The cartoon, which Marvel yep. like did the production of, and the comic, yep. and yet the comic continuity and the and the cartoon continuity was very very different. You know, the GI Joe comic was fairly grounded, whereas like you know the cartoon really mm -hmm. was like would you call that like still transmedia that supported itself, or is that? I a, mean, a were you were you? I mean, they don't have to be one for one, but were you able to watch the cartoon and then read the comic? I mean, that's I would really say the when big I was question. younger, I liked the cartoon, yeah. and when I got older, I I just switched to the comic and gave up on the cartoon yeah i mean because i never i was never a real big gi joe fan so i don't know there's also transformers yeah. though and things like that but like for me in my era for example spider-man and his amazing friends i watched okay. that all the time That's and it point. was you know spider you know stan lee would start off going this is stan lee you know this is and stan lee it was an easy transition You're from right. spider-man to right. it wasn't the same stories but the character was the same and character so. was That's like you recognize spider-man as spider-man whether he was in the comics or whether uh -huh. he was in um you know it was the same general character you know the same personality okay. same costume um yeah those kind of those kind of parts were made for and these are what i often call about i like I don't know if this is, I mean, it's essentially a turn I made up, but the things have on-ramps, right? Yeah. Japanese media has a lot of on-ramps. You can go in through the cartoon, you can go in through the comic, you can go in through the game. There's just on-ramps everywhere. And every on-ramp leads help. into the whole product. It, it, I'm sorry, I keep jumping in, but it's like- Yeah, it, no, it, please, all... it's your show. <laughs> <laughs> Jump You're in all guest. day. Yeah. It's about you today. Uh, it may help that like, in Japan, for the most part, you, you've got like one or two people that are like the driving force of the story, the manga. And then like the anime is usually a very literal adaptation of that. There's usually very few changes and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, if you look at a Spider-Man or something, 
we might have three or four Spider-Man titles at a time, and that's all by different writers and uh, editors and, and artists. So like it can go in a lot of different right, ways. And I can appreciate that versatility, but in terms of having like a sort of one singular vision and lining everything up, it becomes a lot trickier. Oh, absolutely. Hooks. Yeah, absolutely it does. And when you're looking at, especially with Marvel DC stuff, you know, Marvel DC superheroes, it is absolutely tricky. It is one of the odd and, you have to almost think of it as like that's a unique feature rather than a bug because like because that is also what is unique and special and wonderful about dc super, dc marvel superheroes that no other no other comic book um i guess what you'd say is like no other comic book not genre i want to say but just like world in existence has that it is unique and it is wonderful when done well when that sort of like handing off of legacy is done well like i always use um james robinson starman is the primary example of someone who really understood and was able to leverage that unique aspect of dc as a comic um industry and as a comic culture that exists nowhere else in the u.s you don't get that, oh, in, you France, like you don't get that in japan yeah i know right shock um <laughs> behind you Yes. Oh, yes. There's Starman behind me. Yes. Um, but, you know, I mean, like, so so the authors, I mean, I think like, um, you know, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think there's quite a few that are just like really solid at that. Like Mark Russell is another person who's really solid at capturing that legacy and using mm -hmm. it as a strength rather than a weakness. You know, um, the artist Steve Lieber is extraordinary at doing that. Um, Jeff Parker is another person who's extraordinary at doing that. These are all people who understand how to leverage that as a strength. And then there's other who um, don't grasp it as well. And so it becomes more of a weakness because you pick up one issue and you don't know what's going on and you get lost. And, and a lot of that's corporate stuff. I shouldn't even bring that down to the creator level because a lot of that's like our sales will reach a certain level, you know, hit the reboot button. And, you know, as everyone knows, it's a joke that's been going on. But that's also just specifically Marvel DC. You know, I mean, there's so much more to yeah. Western comics than that, you know, obviously. Um, that was a tangent. I'm not sure quite where it went. But, yeah, I know, no, but this is interesting. Know, Obviously, yeah. you and I could probably just talk about comics theory for a Forever. long time. Yeah, for a and long time. Hopefully, yeah. we've at least given people like you know a few <laughs> interesting like avenues to explore mm -hmm. and maybe comment on in the comic comments below and on social media. Um, let, let, let's just talk like, uh, what do you got in the future? What should people keep their eye out for uh, that Zach Davison has coming out in the future? Uh, I mean, I got more issues of Demon Days coming out, which is great. Uh, our secret hope, I guess, you know, which is now making not so like I hope to do more stuff with Peach, you know, I mean, Peach and I do have a couple different things that could possibly manifest and, you know, and maybe if Demon Days is successful enough, uh, maybe that will happen. Maybe not. You never really know what's happened in the future. Um, I'm doing some more stuff with Dark Horse coming up, uh, some okay. more. Like I've got this really fun comic called Cat Plus Gamer coming out of Dark Horse that I translated that I absolutely loved because it's just so fun. So I like cats. So um, yeah, and I've got secret projects that are not allowed to be announced yet and all that sort of fun stuff too. But, but if you know, somebody wanted to know about those secret projects, where would they find out about them? They would find out most likely on my Twitter account, which is simply at Zach Davison, where I announce everything. I have a website, but like most people with websites, I almost never update it because I'm terrible because I have to actually physically go in and code the website, which is so much more work than going on Twitter and going pack a pack a pack a pack a boom, you know? Yep. Um, yeah. So mostly you'll find me on Twitter. Um, I love engaging with people unless you're an asshole, in which case I'll just block you. But if you actually legitimately want to come and talk, then I'm more than happy to do it. And I think it's a lot of fun. Like, obviously, as you can see from this, I love talking about comics. I'm, I love comics more than anything. Like, they just recently, and I'm so over the moon with this, and it's one of those things where I don't understand why they don't, like, declare this a national holiday. Like, Mike Mignola is writing and drawing a comic for the first time in five years. And to me, that is so much more exciting than announcing a new Hellboy movie or anything. Like, a new Hellboy comic written by Mike and drawn by Mike Mignola. Yeah. Wow. That yeah, I was excited be... about that, too. I shared yeah. that on Twitter because I was pretty excited about that as well. So uh, exciting. Favorites. Yeah. Um, um, what, what are you reading these days that you like? I'm just curious. So, I'm reading uh, I'm reading Space Brothers, which is really just like my addiction. I love Space through? Brothers so much. What's that? Who publishes that? Uh, it comes out through, I believe it's out through Kodansha. I'm not 100% sure. I'm reading it on Comics, Comixology, so I forget okay. what the actual publisher is. Yeah, but Space Brothers is just phenomenal. Uh, I am reading, um, so I just 
popped his name in there, but uh, Mark Russell's second son is such a good comic. I think that one's out by Vault. It's uh, Mark Russell and uh, Richard Pace and Leonard Kirk, and it is just, just blows me away. Oh, I just, well, I've, just, I've got a couple issues to do it now, but <coughs> and I'm going to forget everyone's name, but it just came out from Image. Um, the Good Asian is phenomenal. Oh my God, that is a good okay. comic. And that is a comic that is a history lesson. Like The Good Asian, just like I did with Wayward, there's actually like this whole history in the back. So you get the story. Okay. And then you get like um, all of this history and it is so well done. It is just magnificent. I love it. Appreciate um, that. Yeah. Demon Days is a really good comic. I just think everyone should check it out. No, I've been hearing good things. No, yeah, I've, I've been I've hearing good things really, about uh, Demon Days. and I picked this one up w without knowing that you uh, worked on it. You know, I've been following you on um, Twitter and I, and mm -hmm. I, I, I picked this up. Honestly, um, I also everything I picked up, I, I was like, oh, look, <laughs> Zach's name keeps popping up. And uh and so that's kind of fun uh, yeah. all over the place, Zach. But yeah, I definitely think that Demon Days is uh, pretty fun. Each issue sort of works as a standalone, but anything that says Demon Days all follows um, its own continuity. So mm -hmm. it's not like mired in... Um, no, Deadpool. no. And I, I like that a lot. Like I just started reading. I mean, I could, I could do the same thing and go to my own spinner rack here. Like one thing I think that, D, that um, DC has been doing really great is the series of miniseries like Superman or Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. I love yeah. this kind of stuff. Just like Demon Days, like give me a low investment. And that goes back to some of the stuff that like you say with manga, right? It's like it's, you don't need to know anything other than that one thing. You generally need to know who Supergirl is or you generally need to know the X-Men are, but even then it's not so much. So it's just like low investment. You're not signing on for a lifetime of comics. You're signing on for... And you get one complete story. And I love stuff like that. I will buy those kind of things all day long. Zach, thank you so much for like everything you've shared today. I'm super grateful for your time today. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just thank you. Just sincere yeah. thank you and continued success. And, you know, hopefully we can do some, something like this again in the future. Absolutely. Definitely. All right. All right. Yeah. Keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.